movie recently. I can't remember what it was. Maybe someone can help me. I'll tell you what happened. There, there was a bit of a movie where a guy was like crossing a minefield, um, and then he had to call back to his buddies and sort of tell them how to get across the minefield safely. Who were, they were real scared, but they were able to get safely across because he was calling back to them. I, I don't remember what movie it was. It was probably on an airplane when I was half asleep. But, but we have a, that same guide for our lives, don't we? Jesus living that perfect life and then calling back to us, giving us like a thread to follow. So if we follow him, we'll find a way through without blowing ourselves up, hopefully. Um, so I want to hear how Mark's gospel starts, and someone has been lined up to do a reading for us. So this is a good time for that. Let's go. Do you, have the, do you want me to give you the text? Uh, I've got it with me. Great. It should be up Possibly. Okay, so I'm reading from uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me, comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Hey, thank you so much. Um, the start of this book um, sets the whole tone. I think I love it. Um, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It's all about Jesus. The good news is about Jesus. I mean, it shouldn't shock you, right? The gospel is about Jesus. The church is about Jesus. Christianity is about Jesus. It's kind of in the name, isn't it? Jesus Christ. I have a, a very good friend, I um, haven't seen him for a couple of years, but a very good friend who's a well-known worship leader and songwriter. And he tells a story about the time that his mentor came up to him and challenged him to make sure that his song selections that he uses in conferences or whatever were pointing people specifically to Jesus as the hero. Chris told me once of a time that he was accused of sounding like um, I'm not quite sure the tone of the conversation, but he said he was accused of sounding like an over-enthusiastic Jew, um, because, simply because the songs he was choosing were about me and God, and, but didn't actually mention Jesus. 
So if we want to be Christians, we need to be about Jesus. He's the center of the whole thing. The good news is about Jesus. I mean, it's actually fascinating to me that every story I've ever heard of someone leaving church, um, well, none of them have ever been about Jesus. People might get sick of church because church behaves badly sometimes. Um, They might get worn out with religious rules. They might get annoyed with God for letting something or other happen. But I've never heard someone leave church because they, they were done with Jesus. Jesus, he will walk with you through your pain and suffering, empathizing because he's been there before. Jesus will open his arms to you when you feel, when you've screwed up and, and feel like you've let God down, let someone out, let yourself down. Jesus is the Lord who takes ownership of your chaos and makes something beautiful out of it. Jesus himself, the person of Jesus, is the peacemaker who takes on the punishment for our sin so that we can be friends with God and friends one another, reconciled with one another. Jesus is the hope of the world, him as a person. He is the one who in the face of death can uniquely offer us a tangible hope of the life that God presents to us. God, uh, Jesus is the one who ultimately shows us what love looks like. There's a, there's a phrase going around at the moment, love is love, which is completely useless as a phrase, obviously. But you could say anything is the same. That's not a thing. The point is we don't know what love looks like. If you want to know what love looks like, look at Jesus. He shows us what love is. And he actually gives us the power to live in that love as well. See, the Gospel of Mark is about Jesus, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, about Jesus, the Christ. But in fact, the whole Bible is about Jesus. And if I ever get the chance to preach here, well, more often in the future, you'll discover that I will never preach from the Scriptures without showing you how Jesus precisely is the hero in every text. And one of the reasons that Jesus is the hero here is that he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. This is John's message. We read down in verse 7. Um, let me see if I can do this. No, that's the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Next. There we go. This was John's message. After me, says John, comes one more powerful than I am, the straps of whose sandals I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you, says John, with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into the controversy of defining words and phrases this morning, but it's enough to say those that are full of the Holy Spirit are Christians, and it's also true the other way around. Those who are Christians are full of the Holy Spirit. And no one decides who is a Christian apart from Jesus who gives us the Holy Spirit. Jesus fills us with the Holy Spirit. He leads us. He empowers us. Jesus is our hero in part because he sends the Spirit. Now, John understood his commission, John the Baptist, and in the Gospel of John, this is complicated, in the Gospel of John, not John the Baptist, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist says, I must decrease, he must increase. John the Baptist understood that his role was to point people to Jesus and get out of the way. Point people to Jesus and get out of the way. That was John the Baptist's commission, but he's not alone in that, is he? The point people to Jesus and get out of the way. The Holy Spirit does the same thing. Always points away from himself and points to Jesus. The Spirit doesn't take glory unto himself, but always gives the glory to Jesus. And this is the role of the church in many ways. To point people to Jesus, we call people to repent, to give their lives to God, rightly, We point people to Jesus, but then we need to get out of the way. You see, I can't give you the power of the Holy Spirit. The church cannot give you salvation. The only one who is really able to help you or help your friend is Jesus. There's a beautiful story in Mark chapter 2. You might make reference to it next week, where Jesus heals a paralyzed man who's brought to him on a mat. Um, my favorite reflection on that story is that this is exactly what I'm called to do in life. 
to carry my friends to Jesus and then let him do his work. I'm not the saviour, but I take people to the saviour. I bring my children to Jesus. I take them to places where he is honoured. I read stories to them about him. I give them books about him. I teach them to pray so they can talk to him. But in the end, I bring my kids to Jesus and then I get out of the way because they need to have a relationship with him for themselves, not through me. And this is the point, I think, of all ministry, of all of our Christian experiences, that we point people to Jesus and then we have to get out of the way. There's even a sense in which, and this is maybe a bit complicated for this morning, tangentially, but there's even a sense in which we point ourselves to Jesus and get out of the way. You read through the Psalms, you'll see this phrase, my soul praise the Lord, like telling my soul to praise the Lord. It's almost kind of pointing ourselves to Jesus and getting ourselves out of the way to let him do his work. It's deep, and I'm not going to go further with that this morning. But You see, pastoral care, evangelism, preaching, the job of a pastor or minister is to bring people to Jesus and then get out of the way. The job of the church as a whole is to bring people to Jesus and get out of the way. And the job that God has given you, every single one of you, whether you know it or not just yet, your job is to bring people to the Savior, to Jesus Christ, and then watch as he does his miracles. Amen? Amen. Good, thank you. And the reason this works is exactly what Mark moves on to show us in the next verse. Well, I can't actually remember which verse number this is. Verse 9, I think, is just about. Verse 11, maybe. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And this is why that works. You see... There's a kind of a sense of relief in this phrase. I'm not saying that God is relieved, but there's a sense of that feeling of relief. We are all meant to live like Jesus lived, and we have all failed. And that's, a, that, that, that's the story of humanity. And it's like God the Father looked down on the first 30 years of Jesus' life and went, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's what human life could be. You are my son. That's how, I'm pleased with that. That's how I designed it to be. I'm proud of Jesus. If you want to know what life should look like, maybe this is the most proud dad moment in the whole of the Bible, I reckon. I actually have preached more times on the, the baptism, temptations of Jesus than any other passage in the Bible. I've probably done more than 50 hours of sermons on that whole idea. Um, but for today, I want to just say this. This is the moment... The baptism of Jesus, you are my son whom I love. This is the moment when you see what life should look like. Jesus submitting to baptism, dedicating his life to the Father, committing to the word, the spirit, committing to the community of faith, and ultimately seeing God's blessing flow through him to others. That's what life is supposed to look like. So when Jesus turns around then and calls to to Andrew and to Simon, who's also called Peter, in the next moment, he says, follow me. It's a call, specifically to walk with him down the road, but also an invitation to live life the way that it was designed to be lived. And when we think about vision and calling, we need to remember the heart of the business is pointing people to Jesus and getting ourselves out of the way. But when we think about our own lives, we're called to follow Jesus ourselves, to let him do his work in us as we follow him. We need to point people to Jesus, but we also need to be pointed to him. And we often forget how to follow him. There's a sense that we are carrying our friends to Jesus, but there's another sense in which that we are like the paralyzed man. We are the victims, if you like, in the story of the Good Samaritan. Yes, we're called to be Good Samaritans to others, but we also need Jesus to be our ultimate Good Samaritan. He picks us up from the side of the road. He binds our wounds. He pays for our healing. He cares for us. And he will return to finish that healing that he started. And we need to learn to live into that. We need to learn to follow Jesus for ourselves. So, having said all that, I want to tell you a bit of a story. And some of you may know this is a bit of an old story. George MacDonald was an author and savant in the 19th century. And he wrote a fantastic little children's book called The Princess and the Goblin. Um, I don't know if it's well read these days. I couldn't even find it to buy. 
Uh, you can see it online, but The Princess and the Goblin. I've got a, I've got a copy of it at home. Um, and he wrote it, I think, in part to celebrate the way in which God leads and cares for us. He starts with a little girl called Irene. I think she's eight years old. And she's becoming increasingly scared living in her castle. Her dad is a king, and he's away on business or something. And she doesn't trust the people in the castle to keep her safe, particularly from the goblins that seem to be around. And one day, her old grandma gives her a magic ring. Grandma tells her to keep this ring safe, and if something bad happens, what she should do, take off her ring and hide it under her pillow. Um, And then a magic thread will come out of the ring. And if she follows the thread, she'll be safe. It will lead her home to her grandma. Well, one day the goblins break into the castle and the girl is terrified. They're coming to get her. But she has the presence of mind to take off her ring, put it under her pillow, and then she begins to follow this thread. Initially, the thread kind of leads her out of the castle and, then it, and sort of towards safety, but then it leads her down into the, the goblin caves. And she's, she's getting confused. And she remembers that Grandma told her to trust the thread, even if it took her somewhat unexpected. But the thread took her deeper and deeper into the caves. And finally, it gets her to a dead end, where the rockfall has sort of blocked the way. And it just goes up to the rockfall, and she's going, what's going on here? And so she tries to turn around and go back, and then she suddenly couldn't find the thread anymore. It didn't work backwards. That's what her grandma had said as well. Instead, she had to go on. So she went back to the rock face and starts to pull at these, the stones that have fallen. And quickly they came away. And to su- her surprise, behind these rock, this rockfall, she found her friend, Curdie, who was a miner, and he'd been trapped behind these rocks. So she rescues this boy, Curdie, and then the thread leads them both, not back up the cave, but actually deeper into the goblin caves, before it finally takes them out to safety through a path they didn't know about far from the goblin army, and eventually it leads her back to her grandma. And that isn't even the end of the story. It's a great story, um, if you're interested. But the part that, I think that's enough for us this morning. See, when Jesus says, come follow me, he's giving us like a ring or a thread to follow. He says, come follow me. Like, Like little Irene, come follow me. And there are several things we need to know about following that thread. The first thing is, and this is very important, If you follow the thread, following Jesus, putting your trust in him, it will take you to places you don't expect, literally and figuratively. I became a Christian when I was 16 um, in response to a youth group weekend away um, in the West Country. And I lived in um, Bex Hill and went to Sidley Baptist Church, where a guy called Dave Bishop was the pastor for a while. Um, He apparently had been a pastor here earlier. So anyway... So I, was, I was a Sussex boy who had become a Christian in the West Country. I never imagined that God would lead me to preach the gospel in China or in South Africa, Norway, Uganda. I never imagined I'd have to move away from the southeast of England, not to New Zealand, certainly not to the wilds of Yorkshire. <laughs> As an aside, it's more terrifying to move from the south of England to the north than it is to move from England to New Zealand, definitely. <laughs> anyway... But here's the thing, I never imagined where God would take me figuratively either. It, 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 just, it, I think about the, the pain that I've had the privilege to encounter in other people's lives. They've opened up their lives and shared their pain with me, for example. I never imagined that people would trust me with that sort of... I never imagined the, the places or the, the challenges that I'd be brought into. There's something about committing to follow Jesus, which puts you in a place where people share their pain with you, and and it takes you to places you don't expect. So following that thread, it takes you to places you you don't expect, but it also means you can't go back. Um, It makes me think of Morpheus in the film Matrix. Once you've taken the pill, you can't go back. You can't unsee what you've seen. But just like the, the princess, you might hit a wall. You probably will. You might get scared stiff, but the thread actually doesn't work backwards. What does Psalm 23 tell us? Even though you walk through the darkest valleys, that, that God will be with us, that Jesus takes us on. You might hit pain in your life. Everyone does, actually. 
And it's in those moments that you pull at the rocks in front of you and discover maybe that there's some blessing behind it you never realized. Because you actually can't follow Jesus and go back at the same time. So you can't go back. It takes you to places you don't expect. The third thing is that other people will be blessed if you follow Jesus. Other people will be blessed, and you don't know who they'll be. In our story, the miner, this boy Kurdi, um, is saved because of the faithfulness of the little princess. But in, in my story, I could tell of a few people who I've known have been blessed, maybe even saved, because Emily and I have followed the thread that God's given us. We've crashed into other people's lives and, and hopefully left little imprints of grace wherever we've been. I'm sure you could tell us the same story as yourself. I mean, just one story. There's a Lithuanian girl that I met in Leeds, and she spoke very little English, but it transpired that she had been trafficked out of Eastern Europe, and she had managed to escape and just turned up at church because she didn't know where else to go. And you're just able to offer that grace, that safety, and then being able to help her to use the church phone to call her parents for the first time in six months. You leave little imprints of grace if you trust God and, and follow him. Other people will be blessed if you follow a life of faith, when you follow that thread. And finally, that thread will lead you home. Irene is finally led home, where it's safe, to her grandma. And you will find peace. You will find your true home only if you cling to that thread of faith. I mean, there's a sense in which Mark's gospel is a personal testimony, actually, of the apostle Peter. There's, there, are, there are, as you'll discover over the next few weeks, no action shots in Mark's gospel where Peter is not present. Um, Matthew's different. It reflects on the way that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Luke is different. He sees things from different perspectives, trying particularly hard to see things from the perspective of the, the marginalized. Uh, John is a different type of writing altogether, much more like a series of reflections on the life of Jesus, organized maybe around themes, not chronology. But Mark is fast-paced and pretty much all from Peter's perspective. I mean, you see in verse 18 to 20, let's see if we can get this up. Oh, that's the princess and the goblin. I should learn how to use this. Um, where you, come follow me, where you, you go where you don't expect, there's no going back, others will be blessed and you'll get home. Um, but in verse um, 18 to 20, we see this, or no, sorry, verse 16. Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon, who's also called Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. That call, come follow me, changed Peter's life. And it was that moment when he grabbed onto the thread and started this crazy roller coaster journey home. I don't know how well you know Peter's story, but it certainly takes him to places he would not expect the Mount of Transfiguration, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water, the run-ins with the religious authorities. It was a crazy ride for him. And that was all just before Pentecost. The stories of Peter after Jesus' resurrection, in some ways even more crazy, preaching to thousands, breaking out of prisons, going to Rome to be executed because he kept telling people Jesus was raised from the dead. The thread took him to places he would never expect. And at times he lost faith and tried to turn back At times he lost faith and tried to turn back, but each time he found he couldn't actually go back, whether by the fireside after Jesus was arrested or at the beach when he's been fishing after the resurrection. The thread doesn't work backwards. It doesn't work backwards, but he discovered pretty quickly that if you do follow it, others will be blessed on the journey. And this narrative, Mark's Gospel, as embarrassing as it is to Peter, has blessed millions, if not billions of people over the last 2,000 years. Is blessed people because it's a story of a man who picked up this thread and has followed Jesus. And a story of how that thread has led him to blessing of many, how it led to his salvation, and how Jesus ultimately led him home. And Simon Peter, or the disciple, um, or, or Simon's disciple called John Mark, who's the author of this book, is convinced that this thread works to the extent that I think he would have seen verse 17. Come follow me, as an invitation to his readers as well. 
There's an invitation to us. Come and follow Jesus. It works, and he has confidence in it, not just because Peter has done it, but because Jesus himself modeled how to follow that thread. You see, Jesus was sent from heaven, holding on to this thread of faith. He was sent to places that he... Jesus would never expect that. We would never expect to find the Son of God humbled to death, even the death of a criminal on a cross. The ultimate unexpected place for God. Jesus was a blessing to many in his life, but as a result of his complete faithfulness to the Father, he has offered us the ultimate blessing of peace with God and with one another. And not only did this thread lead Jesus home, His resurrection, his ascension, raised him up from his rightful place at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But it's done something else as well. He's broken through that barrier. He's pulled away those stones that we could never do. He's broken through that final barrier, the power of death. So that if we follow the thread of faith, we can also experience his eternal life. As he says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So I want to leave a real simple question for you this morning. Jesus says, follow me. It's like a, a thread attached to a ring. And I'm going to ask you, will you pick up that thread? Don't worry about the people around you. Don't worry about the organizations you're part of or the whatever else is going on in your life. This morning, the question is for you personally. Will you pick up that thread of faith? Will you follow Jesus? That's the question that this passage poses to us. You will end up in places you don't expect. It will be the greatest ride of your life, but you will not be able to turn back. Once you've taken that step of faith, There's no turning back. And you will end up blessing people as you follow that faith, and it will lead you home. And the the thing is, you can try and flesh this out in different ways, but every one of you, if you're listening and particularly care what I'm trying to say, will, will know exactly what you need to do to make a faith decision this morning. You know what you need to do. The Spirit's prompting your heart already. You might need to allow yourself to hope in a situation that feels desperate. God says, I want you to hope again. That means an act of faith. Hope is painful. Hope is costly. He says, trust me, hope again. You might need to reach out to someone to forgive them. I can say that because I don't know your relationships at all now. There might be some forgiveness that's needed. You might need to reach out to someone to forgive them. Forgiveness is costly. It's an act of faith. You might this morning think, oh, hang on, I've never actually really thought about following Jesus, following a life of faith, living a life of faith. You might know this morning, feel it just in your heart, I need to talk to someone about actually living as a Christian, becoming a Christian this morning. Maybe the next step for you is to get baptized You know it. Maybe the the next step is to become a member of the church. Maybe the next step this morning is to ask someone to pray for you about a particular challenge that you face because life is just a bit too hectic right now. I don't know. But you know specifically in your life because the Holy Spirit is poured out on those God loves, all of us, which is, so Jesus gives us here and now and he's working in our heart, working in all of our hearts, to show us what we need to do to follow this life of faith. It's the thread that we hold on to. It's not for someone else to tell you what to do. So my encouragement this morning, beyond anything else, is to jump in, to grab that thread of faith and jump in. I promise me, I promise you, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. And it will be the adventure of your life. Um, I want to pray for you. Um, We're going to sing one final song after I do, which is Oceans, which talks about um, trusting God and going where he's calling us and following that thread of faith. Um, And it may be that during that song, um, God prompts you that you need to pray with someone or talk to someone about something that's in your life. And 
you don't need to stand in lines and sing nicely. Um, you're very welcome to move and go and find someone to pray for you. I think there's people going to be praying for you if you stand by the prayer banner in the corner. But you don't need to go there. There's lots of other people that can pray for you here. You know what you need to do. Let's grab that thread of faith. Father God, we pray this morning, as your presence is with us, that you give each and every person in this room, firstly, the clarity, and secondly, the courage to grab a hold of that thread of faith, knowing that we'll be led places we don't know, knowing that we'll be taken into situations which confuse us, trouble us, knowing that we're going to be led by you in our spirit. Father, give us the courage and the clarity that we need to follow you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. In the-